Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. As you can hear, I'm slowly getting better from my cold, which is just lovely. And I'm going to kick things off today with something from Intel. And what we have here is a various listings by various online retailers for the flagship Xeon W3175X, which is a 28 core processor designed for the LGA3647 socket and is supposedly going to be launching this month. Now that number of cores is definitely going to raise an eyebrow as I'm sure you all remember that infamous 28 core process that we saw showed off by Intel not too long ago. The one where there was all those pictures floating around of the, shall we say, interesting cooling. So it seems to me like it's, it's, that, it's that very same one. But what we have here is a very expensive chip. It is obviously going to be for the ultra enthusiast. You know, the pre this is the top end of the top end. This is not going to be for your average user, given that it costs around four thousand US dollars. And no, I didn't just misspeak. Four thousand US dollars. So what do we have here in terms of specs? Well, it's twenty-eight cores, fifty-six threads. And a base clock of 3.1 gigahertz and a boost of three sorry 4.3 out of the box it has 38.5 megs of l3 cache support for ddr4 6 channel memory up to 2666 megahertz and 68 pcie lanes and it will also feature full overclocking support and will allow up to 512 gigs of memory now, do keep in mind that these prices have not been confirmed by Intel, but we have four listings here from four different retailers which list it at different prices, but it still comes in at around $4,000-ish, sometimes even more. So we have from Eddie's Comp, and we have for VAT included a price of $4,680.97, and then we have on the Lance Nakupi, um, Nakupi, excuse me, a listing of $5,144 after VAT, and then on Kickatech we have $6,782 with VAT, and then finally on PC21 we see a price of $4,220, including VAT. So those prices are varying quite wildly, as I'm sure you can agree. So we can probably expect it to sort of hover in the middle somewhere around there if these prices are indeed accurate. But either way, we're looking at a very high-end, very expensive part. Obviously, this is a Xeon, so, you know, obviously it's going to be expensive. It's going to be for, you know, for your workstations and all that sort of thing. Now, obviously... <sighs> But if you're looking for pure cores and even like the PCIe lane count and all that sort of thing, AMD obviously has an offering that is significantly cheaper than this just for the chip. Obviously, that's not counting anything extra like memory and motherboards. And we don't know what exactly is going on with the boards here for this Xeon chip because we only have two having been shown at the moment which supports the 3175X and they are not, they weren't complete at the time of being shown. So yeah, with with Threadripper existing, it's hard to say how much this is going to see usage outside of the really sort of top end enthusiast workstation scenarios. But of course, it is highly possible that these prices are incorrect. So do keep all of that in mind. But if it's true, it's a bit of a tough sell, to be honest. So let's move on, shall we, to something regarding the RTX 2080 tie. So you may recall a little while ago I discussed the Port Royal benchmark coming from 3D Mark, which is going to be the first one out on the market dedicated to ray tracing. Of course, we had that in Milk one for Windows short um, not that long ago, but obviously this is a more sort of complete product, I suppose you could say. It's coming out on January 8th. And what we actually had is a Galax GOC event in Vietnam where various overclockers were there basically trying to get the highest score possible. It's sort of a bit of a competition. And what we had here was a Swedish overclocker by the name of Tobias Bergström who scored 11,069. And he was well ahead of his competitors, but he was using liquid nitrogen. 
So he heavily overclocked the 2080 Ti to 2.64 MHz core clock and 2.088 memory clock, again with liquid nitrogen, and he managed to average around 51.25 frames per second. This was with a 9900K on a Z390 from ASRock. Now, unfortunately, there's no mention of the resolution, but... Still worth keeping in mind the score that he got and, of course, the average frames per second. There are some uh, theories being banded around just due to the press releases and information that 3 d Mark themselves have released that this was running at 1440p, so perhaps at 1080p we'd see a more pleasing result. But again, this 2080 tie was heavily overclocked and on liquid nitrogen. So even if you were to take it down to 1080p, uh, what sort of results are you going to get on a consumer level PC? Probably not the sort of results that you would hope for. Now, are there going to be optimizations released in terms of, you know, graphics drivers from NVIDIA and all that sort of thing? Yes, probably, but... I don't know, this is not a particularly encouraging result, but obviously we should still wait and see because, again, there may be new driver support improvements and maybe an improvements to the benchmark itself, but 51.5, let's assume on 1440p, on this heavy and overclock, just goes to show you that, you know, as impressive as ray tracing is, it's extremely demanding even for a card like the RTX 2080 Ti. I'm going to be very curious to see what happens when this app gets into the hands of the public on January 8th to see the sort of results that a consumer level graphics card setup, you know, normal PC setup is what I mean to say, are actually going to achieve on perhaps base clocks or the sort of mild overclock that most people are going to be running. So let's move on to our next topic, which is actually regarding the Xbox. Now, of course, you may recall back earlier this year that we would be seeing a sort of streaming console in development at Microsoft, and we had reports that the Xbox Scarlet was actually a family of devices, one of which was going to be a lower power streaming console that was going to be used in conjunction with cloud gaming. And of course, there was something by the name of Project X Cloud announced not too long ago. So this would be alongside a more traditional, more powerful Xbox console. Now, according to a leaker, Microsoft is really looking at a semi-custom Picasso chip from AMD for this next gen streaming Xbox. And apparently this is due to the power consumption versus performance ratio of the Picasso APU and this will apparently going to allow is going to allow sorry a small form factor for the hardware but also enable Microsoft to keep this price low because again this is going to be a streaming console they're probably going to keep it small form factor cheap in comparison to the mainline console at least and we're also apparently going to be seeing quote unquote latency sensitive calculations made locally but we're going to be seeing deep learning in both data centers and on the Picasso silicon itself and we're undoubtedly going to be seeing deep learning playing a part here as well, as we did see real-time AI announced by Microsoft last year by the name of Project Brainwave. Perhaps we could see some form of that playing a part here as well to, you know, on the servers and the console with sort of deep learning applications, you know, predicting the actions of a player and minimizing latency and all that sort of stuff. And obviously would tie fairly nicely into the streaming console itself. As we have seen with game streaming, with the repeated attempts to make it work in various different ways on both, you know, sort of software and hardware sides, that latency problem is a critical solve for anyone attempting to do this, Microsoft or whoever. So that is something that they are obviously very aware that they need to get as low as possible. There are undoubtedly going to be some games that are just not going to work very well on the streaming console, like for example fighting games, that sort of thing, like multi at least when playing on multiplayer. But perhaps they've got some revolutionary things going on in the background that we don't know about yet that would solve this problem in ways we don't expect. And obviously this isn't going to work so well with someone with a sort of not so great internet connection, but obviously they're not just doing a streaming Xbox, they're doing the mainline one as well. So they're sort of offering it as an option for people. So speaking of AI and all that sort of interesting stuff, we actually have a really interesting report concerning a new type of quantum computer. And what you have here is a really interesting press release for some, about something by the name of IonQ. 
So what we actually have here is a really interesting press release on something by the name of Ion Q, which is a new type of quantum computer and was founded on a bit of a risk, a bit of a dice roll as it were, that trapped ion quantum computing could actually outperform these silicon based quantum computers that we are seeing built right now by various companies and at present at least it is actually doing so they have constructed a quantum computer that can perform calculations on a 79 qubit array and have actually beaten google's efforts by about seven qubits and they are also seeing some very impressive error rates as well and their error rates are currently the best in the business. We have single qubit error rate at 99.97%, and their nearest competitor is around 99.5%, whereas most are actually coming in around 95%. Now, according to IonQ, this new quantum computer is in the sort of workloads that you know, you're going to be using a quantum computer for, it is already overtaking the competition. We have a new benchmark called the Bernstein Vazirani algorithm. This is something that Ion Cure have been to launch themselves, and it essentially tests a ability of a computer to determine a single encoded number when the computer can only ask a simple yes no question. So we have a bit of a statement here from the CEO of IonQ, Christopher Monroe, who says, quote, after two years of work, our against the grain bet is paying off. The IonQ system is robust and industrial strength, even at this early stage. The results show that Ion Trap design has all the advantages we expect and more. Now, he does make it clear there himself that this tech is in the early stages. They're obviously still working on improvements, and there are undoubtedly going to be issues and problems to iron out. The main issue is slow operation times and massive sizes as well. But we're going to be seeing IonQ let some companies have access to this tech in the next year sometime. But again, this is in the early stages, but it's looking promising to say the least. Obviously, we've seen Intel and other companies talk a lot about quantum computing, you know, supercomputers, all that sort of stuff. Again, not really something for your eye, but it is still fascinating, I have to say. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Your support, as always, is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe, and if you'd be so kind, at least give our Patreon page a look-see. If you don't um, support us, that's absolutely fine. Just you watching this video is highly appreciated. So thank you so much again for watching. Bye-bye.